Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to um, today's session, How Can Entrepreneurs Not Just Recover from the Crisis, But Actually Rejuvenate the Economy? It's my pleasure to be here for this afternoon's session. My name is Thomas Hellman. I'm a professor of entrepreneurship here at the SAE Business School. And I am um, leading the Creative Destruction Lab here at Oxford, which is hosting today's session. It's a real pleasure to be here and to welcome a very distinguished panel. And together we plan to address what we think are some of the most pressing questions, not in the immediate next few weeks, but really over the next quarter over the next year, over the next couple of years, and they deal with the question of the role of entrepreneurs and the role of innovation in bringing us out of a crisis into a new normal. So um, the Creative Destruction Lab has been um, at Oxford for one year, and I just want to pause very briefly and reflect on the name, Creative Destruction Lab is a controversial name. And in fact, several people have suggested to us, Can, can't you find something more pleasant, uh, something that's easier to market? And the answer is no. Um, the Creative Destruction Lab is based on uh, a phrase that was coined by the great economist Joseph Schumpeter um, over 100 years ago. Joseph Schumpeter thought about the forces of innovation in the economy and was the first one to provide a systematic understanding of what roles established corporations, governments have, but then he pointed um, in the direction of saying entrepreneurs actually play a key role in shaking up the economy and creating creative destruction. So the word creative destruction has a nice part and a not so nice part. The nice part is the creative bit. Uh, we all love creativity, we all want to see the new and shiny thing, but the work of Schumpeter tells us very clearly that it comes at a cost and it sometimes comes at the destruction of old structures. Now, this could be at the destruction, at the, at the failure of existing companies. It could be at the, the failure of existing organizations. Um, maybe also habits and ways of doing business. And so no one ever said this process is going to be easy. Um, today, we're meeting in the middle of, of an unprecedented crisis. So what does creative destruction have to do with that? Well, frankly, that's what we're here to find out because um, the underlying thesis or the underlying questions that we want to examine today is what is the role of entrepreneurs in shaking up the economy and bringing it to a new normal? And that path is not expected to be easy. We're here to better understand it. Now, I'm very happy that um, uh, I brought together um, uh, the community um, of, of Creative Destruction Lab, but in fact, a, a broader community of experts. And um, every panelist today is very active in the entrepreneurial ecosystem, often in, a, in an investor venture capital role. But our four panelists bring very different perspectives and therefore can give us a better understanding of and maybe hopefully even some disagreements about the role of entrepreneurs in this crisis. So without further ado, I'd like to um, briefly introduce each of the four panelists. I'm then going to explain the topics and then I'll hand over to um, our panelists. And our first panelist um, will be Alice Hu Wagner. Alice Hu Wagner is a managing director at the British Bank, a, a relatively young organization that is a, a governmental organization. Um, we're very delighted to, um, to, to have her with us. Um, and uh, She comes from a distinguished career um, in banking. She, she worked at, at Barclays, at Lloyd's. But most importantly, she is a leading a lot of the strategic thinking at the British Business Bank. Now, I obviously want you all to understand that she's not at liberty to talk about everything that's happening inside, but she's very eager to share all of the programs and efforts that are happening at the British Business Bank to address the current crisis. And so we're very lucky to have her, frankly. Um, our second panelist will be Sir Chris Deverell. Sir Chris Deverell um, comes from a very different career, a very distinguished career in the UK military and the Ministry of Defense. He is the former commander of the UK Joint Forces Command. And after a very long and distinguished career in, in the military, he recently um, retired. He's now running 
several innovation funds. He's also giving back a lot to the community and in fact uh, is a member of the council of the University of Oxford and playing a very important role there. Our third panelist is Julia Hawkins. Julia Hawkins is a venture capitalist. There she's raising her hand. And um, Julia Hawkins is a partner at Local Globe, one of the leading London-based uh, venture capital firms that um, has a sort of um, European focus, not just a UK focus. And um, Julia is an expert on health, and in fact, she will be able to maybe also help us understand some of the specific public health issues that um, we're dealing with and how entrepreneurs are tackling them. And she has a distinguished prior career in finance, Goldman Sachs, in the media, at the BBC, and now with Local Globe. Finally, our, our fourth panelist, um, Chris Wade. Um, Chris Wade is, um, the way I think of Chris, is a real entrepreneur, a serial entrepreneur. He built a very significant company called Cambridge Positioning System. Uh, and um, right now he is running his own venture capital firm called um, Isomer Capital. Before that, he also has a career. Um, he worked in large corporations in Nortel. He worked in the government and worked with the UK Trade and Investment um, Division. So has a really good perspective on the questions that I'm now going to pose to the entire panel. So there are really three things that um, I'd like you to talk about. What are the roles of entrepreneurs in the crisis? That's sort of the high level question. But then we're going to break that down into what do you see as the specific problems in the current crisis for which entrepreneurs are well positioned? And the idea here is to go back to Schumpeter. And Schumpeter says entrepreneurs are very good at certain things like creative destruction, but maybe established corporations play um, a role and a different role and have different relative strength. And obviously the government is yet another really important player understanding the relative advantages and the problems that entrepreneurs are well positioned. And maybe the ones that entrepreneurs frankly cannot solve will be the topic of today. And then the final question is the one who says problem also should say solution. And so we're looking, I'll, I'll be very interested to hear on which areas are entrepreneur currently tackling and you're excited about the new solutions they're gonna bring that are gonna transform the way we, the way we work, the way we, our medical system work and the way uh, we live. The whole event is in some sense um, brought to you or, or not, not, um, in, in collaboration with the Creative Destruction Lab, which I lead. Um, the topic chosen today is very important to us, um, so important that in fact we've launched uh, on a very quick note um, a, a new initiative called CDL Recovery, which is precisely meant to help entrepreneurs who have solutions for the current crisis to be accelerated and you know several people on the panel have already been incredibly helpful in that effort i would now um i i've said enough it's my pleasure alice um you'll be uh, first maybe just introduce yourself a little bit more and then um give your initial view on the topic of creative destruction in this crisis Certainly. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, thank you for having me here today. Um, so I am with the British Business Bank, which is the UK's domestic development bank. What that means is that we uh, support all things to do with UK smaller businesses um, through all forms of finance. Uh, in the context of this conversation, we are also the largest sort of domestic uh, institutional investor into UK venture capital and one of the largest sort of in Europe and, and the world. So we actively, uh, we don't just do equity, of course, we also have lots of um, interventions in the debt space. Uh, which you will have heard of uh, with the um, coronavirus sort of business inter interruption loans and the bounce back loans and so on. Um, I uh, I definitely have been working with Thomas for a few years uh, collaboratively and enjoying it greatly. And I'm I'm very excited to talk to this audience because we absolutely believe that entre entrepreneurs are critical to the long term sort of policy objectives of government, which is what the British Business Bank serves. Um, in particular, I think that uh, in, you know, as Thomas mentioned, entrepreneurs are particularly good at seeing and exploiting opportunities and disruption. And what we're going through right now is, if anything, one of the largest disruptions on a secular basis that we've seen in. Mm, well, probably my lifetime at least, possibly longer. 
post Second World War would have been mine, or maybe the 70s OPEC crisis would have been the last thing that was as, as extreme as what we're seeing now. And the great thing about entrepreneurs is that you're agile and you can move around and you you don't ha you're not loaded down with sort of um, the past and sort of locked in sort of positions. You have the ability to kind of pivot and move and be flexible and adaptable because you have you know because because that's the way that you are. So you have small you're you know you have that. Um, scope of imagination, um, which I think will help us create the future in the sense of both the jobs of the future and the society of future, of the future. So, in terms of the specific problems, um, I'm going to talk about two different things. One is uh, some of the problems of our society are not changed by COVID-19. Okay, they will. They're mega trends that have been with us for a while, and they will continue. Um, the crisis, the current health crisis, only makes certain things worse. So, for example, um, I've been actively involved with the longevity um, uh, agenda, which is about the fact that we have an aging society in most of the West, and actually in places like Asia as well, who might be getting old before they get rich. Okay, that is still going to be a problem. And then if you're in a world where all the over 70s are, are particularly vulnerable to lockdown or so on, you know, that, that is an issue, and that is, that's, not, that's a problem. That's also an opportunity. Uh, similarly, climate change. Climate change will continue, uh, notwithstanding the, the improvements this year, um, they will, it will continue to be an issue, right? Um, internationalization or the reverse of internationalization will continue to be you know, a, a problem. How do you, you know, observe and respect borders while, whilst efficiently jumping over them as well, right? Solutions which help us do that. You know, the world's your oyster, not to, not to be too corny about it. Um, but there are certain specific problems that we think are probably going, that weren't that big of a deal, call it six months ago, that sadly are going to be more of a big deal in the next sort of um, period of time. For example, unemployment, youth unemployment specifically, right? Uh, I think I think it is going to be. We know that there are social and societal impacts to that, and one of the things that um, entrepreneurs do is they create jobs. And they also create sort of the new jobs that can adapt to the current environment. Um, now, in terms of solutions, I'm going to defer to my panel, my fellow panelists, more on the solutions. I mean, um, my only, uh, I mean, working for government, we we try to enable a wide range of solutions, um, but we try not to necessarily uh, mandate the solutions. All I would say is that um, we have come to a point in time where ideologically, I think. Um, uh, even a, even with an audience like the one I know I'm I'm, I'm talking to you today, um, you know, government is actually government and regulations. Okay, are important. No man is an island. Okay, but there and so working with sort of these policy objectives, working with what government wants to do is is actually uh, one path, or at least not going against the grain of it, is probably a, a successful or a useful thing to do. Um, I'll give you an example. One of my one of my favorite stories. So. Um, uh, the last time we had our industries were particularly hit by something imposed by government was something like the prohibition of alcohol in the U.S., right, in the 1920s, uh, 100 years ago, okay? And during that period, the, you know, if you were a brewery or a vineyard, right, I mean, this was absolutely devastating to your uh, business model and disruptive in the same way, let's say, you know, the current lockdowns are affecting the airlines. Right now, if you look at the, some of the best vineyards, sort of in the U.S. in Napa Valley and so on, the, you know some of them actually managed to live through that period. And the way they did that was through sacramental wine. As a um, you know, for those of you who are Catholics, you know it is it is one of those um, things that you you have as part of the church. And that was an exemption for the government allowed. Right, if you produced wines for sacramental purposes, you were allowed to. And what that allowed was a, a basic level of the vineyards to sort of survive through, get through the prohibition, they find other ways of creating sort of revenues and then be able to take advantage of it sort of going on uh, sort of afterwards. And, and that is an interesting thing. Like, you know, um, there, is, there is opportunity in the destruction of sort of whole swathes of sectors. Um, I mean, the other, the other example, and it's a little less happy one, is um, of course, following the Second World War, um, the massive bombings in, for example, places like Germany, also were an opportunity for Germany to invest in the latest, highest quality capital equipment, 
and was one of the reasons why that plus the Marshall Plan meant that, you know, if you had the latest capital equipment, you were more efficient and you were able to sort of take off, right? Um, and that wouldn't have been possible if there was sort of a installed base that hadn't been destroyed um, that, that would have sort of locked in people into not adopting innovations. So to some degree, you, there is opportunity there too. I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of stop there and, and leave it uh, and pass on to my next panelist. Uh, thank you. That was a wonderful start. Um, we'll go to Sir Chris Deverell next. Thank you, Thomas. I'm I'm really grateful for this opportunity, and I'm I'm looking forward to some great learning in this conversation. I think I should start by saying that the the simple definition of entrepreneurship that I like best is the pursuit of opportunity beyond resources controlled. The pursuit of opportunity beyond resources controlled, which comes from Howard Stevenson, I guess, decades ago at the Harvard Business School. So having defined what I think we're talking about when we're talking about entrepreneurship, the second thing I can, I'd like to say is that I can't think of any dimension in life in which there could not be, at least in theory, a role for entrepreneurship. I don't think there's any problem that is in principle too big or too small or too difficult for an entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial solution. And as a result of digital technology, I think that we're far better placed to scale these solutions than any time in history. Indeed, I am sure that data is the, at the heart of our route through this problem. Furthermore, I think it is certain that um, the appetite for or tolerance of new ways of doing things is likely to be higher in a crisis than it is in more normal times. So I think the time is ripe for entrepreneurship as, as I think both you and Alice have already said. That said, I think to help um, provide a focus and as a general proposition, I would advocate that entrepreneurs should play to their strengths, the, the most fundamental of which are a focus on opportunity, a, a willingness to take risk, urgency, and agility. Now, as to specific solutions, there are plenty of obvious problems to address. You know, we can see them every day, testing, contract tracing, vaccination, treatment, enabling congregation of people, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it's equally obvious that there will be many thousands of people going after those same problems. So, I mean, I, what I would say is go after problems or opportunities. We don't know we've got until you show them to us. And I think it also plays to get close to science, which I, which I think at some level always underpins breakthroughs. And don't think this is nearly over. I mean, Bill Gates has said that we've only heard the first third of this story, quoting Churchill to suggest that we are at the end of the beginning. But I think he's overestimating what has happened already in an event that is comfortably more impactful than anything else in my lifetime, which is probably longer than that of most people on this webinar. To close um, these opening remarks, I'd like to um, refer you to a fabulous documentary I was watching recently on BBC iPlayer. It was about primates. And we saw capuchin monkeys using rocks and stones to crap open fruit to get at nuts. And so I want you to picture the scene thousands of years ago, a bunch of capuchins sitting around, they're hungry, one of them picks up a rock and smashes a plant open and monkey superfood pops out in the form of a nut. And one of the observing monkeys said to another, well, fancy that, who knew? So I think the entrepreneur should be seeking out the rock and the plant with the intention of being the first monkey to exploit the opportunity that is latent in the combination. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, and um, that, that was wonderful, and I just can't resist it, but um, Schumpeter's definition of entrepreneurship was the recombination of existing resources to a new use, and so that tagged extremely nicely with um, what you were um, sharing with us. Thank Indeed. you very much. Uh, um, um, we're going to make this more interactive, but we're, we're going to start with um, our, our opening comments, and so I'm going to go um, to Julia. Um, it's wonderful to have you all yours. 
Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to to be on this this panel. And um, so I'm Julia. I'm a partner at Local Globe. Um, I guess I wanted to share a little bit about uh, what we have been doing since the start of COVID. Um, we actually created a group uh, that we're calling Alpha Works, um, and this is a group that's creating localized um, delivery models for rapid prototypes and shared learning. And and by that. I actually mean we've actually been been working very closely with our local community in Summerstown and in Camden, as well as at a at a national level, to try to to try to help in in the way that we can uh, to to solve some of the more urgent uh, problems that we're seeing. So in Summerstown, for example, creating food hubs and delivering food to food banks. Uh, we've done connectivity assessments uh, to help, for example, the connectivity needs in primary schools as well as high schools. Um, and, and we've done uh, pilots uh, that solve or try to solve for isolation problems that we're seeing. So working actually alongside um, charities as well as with big corps like Amazon. Um, and we've launched a food, uh, food supermarket pilot alongside co-op. Um, and I think, I guess what, what I'm seeing is that the role of the entrepreneurs, much as has been already mentioned, is that uh, capturing this opportunity um, and capturing what we're seeing in terms of need. So the need around food, the needs that we're seeing in health, the needs that we're seeing in connectivity and isolation, as well as to get help us get out of this crisis when it comes to the role, obviously, of uh, of of incorporating not just contact tracing, but also testing, and then combining that with um, with mobility. So for example, how do we use a, this notion of a, a proof of health uh, to enable us to, to either get Get back to work, to to travel, uh, not just domestically, but but uh, internationally as well. And I guess what what I've what I've seen a bit speed of execution of learners not know so well. For example, Accurix they launched a, a video product over the end, which uh, has meant they are now in. 95% of GP practices, um, and which has added tremendous value to, to obviously to, to patients as well as uh, GPs. Um, and, and I think it's, um, I think it's these kinds of products that are, are now becoming tran transformational, but are here to stay. Um, and so I guess those are the, the, the kinds of things that, that, that we are seeing uh, and that we see the, the, the areas where entrepreneurs can continue uh, to play a really important role, not just within the now, but obviously in the um, in getting getting the economy and getting our 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 lives back. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, our final panelist will be um, Chris Wade. So over to you, Chris Wade, for your opening thoughts. Um, you need to unmute yourself, Chris. Well, given that I've seen who's on the call from all these parts of the world. I'm not going to say good morning or good afternoon. I'm going to say welcome entrepreneurs. Um, you know what's remarkable about entrepreneurs is the speed that they adjust to this current situation. Um, they have um, reduced cost. Um, they have been able to change business models. Um, in Isomer, we invest in VCs. Um, we have, in our first iteration, our first fund, we have 24 VCs, 600 companies. We have a travel company, a company that hires uh, temporary staff for hotels. And you can imagine, that's a company that's in trouble right now. So what do they do? They pivot themselves to be able to find people to pick fruit, um, strawberries particularly. Um, and it's a small, non-technical example, but it's an example of what's going on. I want to make my comments quite short um, because there's lots of wonderful erudite um, statements and comments have been made.
digitally. Um, Julia mentioned Atrix, which I remember from my days at um, EF, um, Entrepreneur First, that produces wonderful, wonderful companies. Um, how well they're doing, maybe not so well known, is a Danish company called Corti that is AI for listening and understanding and interpreting calls that come to emergency centers and helping the the call handler actually figure out what the call's about. And this has had come into its own in the last two or three months in understanding words that imply COVID-related uh, diseases. Um, and the company is propelling itself um, very significantly. In the mobility sector, we're seeing companies that are digitally um, with, with mobile applications, allowing people to lease cars for a short period of time, just booming in sales in the last couple of months. Electric bikes, um, companies that are building brand new electric bikes and electric bike sort of models to, to deploy them across, absolutely increasing their businesses. Um, and that's the interesting story. Um, we worry a lot about the downside um, of this crisis. And outside the context of this particular conversation, there's lots of downside. I don't want to minimize that for one second. But there's a lot of very, very interesting and, and positive things um, happening. And I wonder, and perhaps an interesting conversation, is the transition, the massive transition to online that has been enforced upon us. Um, you know, we live in this slightly digital bubble, um, people in venture capital and entrepreneurs and these kind of people, because we, by definition, are digital. That's what we invest in. That's what we do. But actually, lots of people don't. And as a result of this crisis, they are now becoming completely digital, which is a great opportunity. Uh, it also means that things that that were offline, you know, have a questionable sort of future going forward. What is absolutely critical, and the last thing I'll say, is entrepreneurs are absolutely part of the solution of our society going forward, and it is our role to support them and to figure out how, how we can make um, their world better um, to deliver on the promises of their vision. Um, thank you, that was great. And we've, we've had four very interesting perspectives on, on the current situation. I'm gonna take the privilege of the first question, but I can already see that people are adding questions um, um, through, the, through the chat channel and we'll get to those and we certainly want as many of those as possible. But the one question, and this is an open question to any of um, our panelists, is entrepreneurs are hopelessly optimistic. And we always talk about the dream and the opportunity and our language is colorful. But especially in a time of crisis, um, some people also say, well, it's time to be realist. And remember, the creative destruction is an element of destruction. And um, there's a set of challenges around resource decisions. Economics is about making resource decisions. And if we're gonna put resources into the new and the shiny, something has to go. So I'd love to just take um, a, a, a first comment on how do we tackle that? And just to, to, to be slightly provocative, um, one of the arguments that has been made is for the moment that the government is trying to save everything. And you can't save everything. So thin, mm -hmm. economic structures will change. Where do you see sort of the hammer coming down first and where do you see that tension being um, most important? Alice, did you want to come in there? You're, you're on screen. Yeah, no, I can. Um, and in fact, this actually ties in with one of the questions that just come in about how entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs can respond, but some of them lack funding. And so how's the opportunity? How do you bridge it? And that is, in essence, the same as your question, Thomas, which is that, you know, the critical thing about economics is the allocation of capital, right? Well, actually, it's capital and labor. I, I just want to say that, um, you know, some things don't change, okay? Like, I think all of my venture capital sort of, you know, um, sort of uh, panelists, co-panelists would say that actually 
you know, it's smart money and that people bet on the people, right? On when you're doing a company. And so if you have high quality individuals, so the, the allocation of resources, two things. I mean, it's the people so as well as the money. And one of the um, great opportunities right now is that uh, with, well, mass unemployment and all the rest of it is that we should be able to be able to um, reallocate really high quality, particularly younger people, um, high quality talent uh, into the best opportunities. And that is a matter of just good old, well, I mean, uh, I will leave this to the practitioners about how getting talent, you know, and talent is a scarce resource and you know, there's an opportunity to get more talent, sort of, because quite frankly, working for a big corporate is pretty risky right now too, you know? And so, hey, why not join a startup? I mean, it's just a relative risk of joining a startup as opposed to joining a, a, a big corporate. Just, I mean, like it just did that, right? <laughs> Not because the, the risk of a startup went anywhere. It's just that the risk of the corporate just went up. So, so that's one thing. It's the allocation of people. But that is about people taking those choices. The second thing is the capital, the financial capital. Uh, government does have a role in this. But ultimately, um, you do still have to convince somebody that you will give your, you know, that, that you, you are a decent investment opportunity. And it is harder when we are in a risk off world, right? Um, yeah. We talk to institutional yeah. investors and it is harder to raise. I mean, I'm, I, I'm not saying anything people don't know, right? Like it is harder to raise. It's a higher bar and you have to have your, your ducks in a row. Um, and in particular, there's also a question about diversity. You know, those of us who are perceived as bigger risks for whatever reason, it's going to get even tougher. And, but it behooves those of us who are in a position to make the calls to try and keep that in mind. Like diversity is not a luxury that you know you can't afford when times get tough. It's it's for always because cross reference point about talent, um, you know. And so that there is a challenge for us as a society to make that happen. I think what's possibly useful is if government becomes a major source of capital uh, because we're democratically, well, somewhat democratically. Um, accountable, you know, we, we, we do try to look after that kind of stuff to the, to the best of our abilities. It's, it's not easy, but, um, but I do think that we, we have to make sure that the allocation of financial capital, you know, continues to work, Thomas. Chris. So Thomas, I wonder if I might come in. I mean, so, so I think it would be a, a big mistake for, for entrepreneurs not to be optimistic. Um, you know, I'm, two or three observations. Firstly, to, to Alice's point, I think it was Schumpeter who said that, in general, the owners of stagecoaches don't build railways. <laughs> you know, so, so there are um, lots of corporate organizations, big corporates around the world, who will be struggling to, to cope with this new reality. And, and the entrepreneur has a great head start on, on, on the big corporate. I've come from a big corporate, and it, it's really not easy to affect change. Um, the second thing I'd say about that is that you know, it's tempting to say there is no money. And indeed, the people who are losing money, you know, their voices will drown out um, all other voices. But in my experience, there is always money. It's a question that prioritization changes. And so one has to find a way of appealing to a different prioritization. Um, but it's not as if, you know, capital just disappears from the market. It doesn't. It just, it just is reallocated on a different basis. So I, I think entrepreneurs should continue to be, and it's very important they are, um, optimistic about the future. Thank you. I, get, I guess I would uh, also like to add that in terms of the availability of capital is that there are still, uh, nothing has changed in terms of the number of funds uh, and the amount of capital that they have raised and the amount of capital that is available in the market. Um, and, and the fact that technology remains uh, one, of, one of the biggest growth sectors in the UK economy. Uh, and so I, I think that uh, uh, just to, to reiterate what, what Chris just said, that, the, that uh, founders should feel optimistic and they should feel that um, funds are available and are uh, and there is capital that is that is there that is that is basically available to be deployed so uh, um, I, I think it's people should not feel that uh, the funding is not available because that's actually not not the case um, uh, just building on that, um, um, so Klein was talking in, in, in a forum in my class yesterday, mentioning over 20 billion of dry 
cap I mean, you know, dry powder capital in principle ready to be deployed available in Europe. So clearly that that has not changed. Thank you for for, for bringing that. And um, Chris, did you want to? Chris, well, Wade, you just, come in there? just sure. Just two things um, on the subject of optimism. Um, optimism is always tempted by the cash in the company's balance sheet. Um, in other words, when you're an entrepreneur and you see your revenue stop, if the proposed wonderful A round, B round that you were planning in Q2 this year clearly looks like it is not even possible to even meet people, no mind actually get out and um, get deals done, then the good entrepreneurs will do the right thing will actually continue to build their business, but at a lower cost basis, um, take advantage of some of the, um, the furlough opportunities that are available, which are really, really important, um, and build their business. You know, what government is doing is phenomenal. And I think people like Alice should not feel ashamed that they don't have every answer to every question, because what you're doing is things that normally take years. It took four years to figure out that we should have an EIS scheme. Some will say it was two, two, four years too long, but, but the point is these things take long times to figure out. The number one thing an entrepreneur is in control of is the amount of cash that she or he actually is able to spend. And that is the fundamental point. The second thing I want to make, which may be unpopular, but you wanted some controversy. We're in venture capital. Venture capital is about a distribution of outcomes from your investments. Some will fail, some will do okay. And the great hope is a few will do brilliantly well. And Local Globe is a wonderful example of optimizing for that latter end of. Um, uh, um, of the of those those outcomes, it's an unkind thing to say, but it has to be said that some of the current situation will expedite those companies that are going to fail, which means more capital is available for the companies that need to survive and should survive and build valuable propositions. Um, and so, so that's, that's the, the, the reality of the situation. Everybody has unbridled optimism, but at the end, you have the cash you have. Um, thank you, thank you. Um, now I'm gonna to go to um, the, the questions. We already have a long list of questions and the purpose is not to go through every question one by one, but let me start with um, um, sort of two questions. One is asked by Colin in the UK. Um, who is basically asking um, more specifically to Alice about um, the speed at which uh, government programs can be rolled out. And Colin has a particular concern about um, the fintech sector being um, um, in, in the particular need. And then just on a, on a somewhat related vein, um, there's a question from Yael also in, in the UK asking about the fintech sector and the role of female entrepreneurs and whether there are some um, you know, specific needs. Now, let me add to that question, and, and I think this is a question that is first going to Alice, but then is also open to everybody. To what extent are rescue operations sectorial, or should we target them towards a specific sector and say if fintech needs to be safe, or to what extent can and should we be as inclusive as possible because they trade us on both of these proposals. Over to you, Alice, and then okay. Gee, thanks. Um, okay, so I'll do the sectoral one first because that's the hardest one. Um, there are always at least two schools of thought, right? One which is, uh, and the British Business Bank is traditionally this way, we are sector agnostic because we don't pretend to be able to pick winners. Right. I mean, my, my, my co-panelists do, but but I, we don't. OK, we don't think we can. And um, because we're backed by the taxpayer, we are equal opportunity to all sectors, loved and unloved. Right. Um, and so therefore, in general, our interventions are sector agnostic because that's what's fair. Right. So that everybody has an equal shot if you have. Yeah. And um, and then we rely on the best judgment, of course, of our um, esteemed you know, GPs, our fund managers, to, who all have a point of view, 
Like there's no such thing as a fund manager that doesn't have a point of view and that's as it should be. And then we back people with different points of views. Um, now that being said, the current government also has an industrial strategy whereby you know, cert it's also true that certain sectors are of particular importance in the UK and that competitive or to each whatever country you're in. Um, and, uh, and so for example, the creative sector is particularly important in the UK or the life sciences one, just to pick a couple that are, that are particularly high profile. Um, and more importantly, this recession is being triggered by decisions by government. Yeah, it's not a naturally, well, it is a naturally occurring recession in the sense that it was caused by a disease, but actually the economic recession is caused by the decisions to try and protect public health that is being made by government and therefore, which has a disproportionate impact on particular sectors. I would argue that if we were going to try and pick favorites among sectors, FinTech wouldn't be top of my list, okay? I think that um, there's an entire sector of hospitality that is suffering much greater. Um, just, just, I mean, like if you want to play the which sector is more important, it starts getting really interesting really fast, right? Um, that would be that would be a thought. And uh, more importantly, from a from a policy perspective and a citizen and people's lives perspective, a number of people affected. Uh, most of the government's policies are driven around trying to help the the largest number of small businesses, not necessarily um, particular uh, subsectors. We do. You know, the British Business Bank is, has an explicit objective to support diversity. And so we, we take this very seriously um, in terms of uh, providing competition. And we, we do sort of look at it, you know, very, uh, very closely. So it's the, the, uh, the fintech sector uh, is, um, their, their views and so on are very well known to the bank. And you'll notice that in our accreditation, we have actually had a number of uh, high profile fin fintechs that are actually accredited lenders, for example, Funding Circle, um, but also Starling Bank, um, just to name a female entrepreneur who's very prominent in the fintech space, who is actually a uh, accredited lender uh, to our programs. Now, um, to answer the second question from Yael about sort of the funding potential of female entrepreneurs, I think I'm, I'm on the record having done a piece of work with regards to the investing in women code and VC for, for uh, female founders. It's not just FinTech, it's, it's, um, it's actually throughout the sectors. And there's actually, um, Diversity VC has a whole list of best practices for how to sort of make that better. And we haven't forgotten about that, right? Like, like I said, diversity is not a luxury, it's a necessity. And, um, but I wouldn't say that the, necessarily that the, the, the um, position of a female entrepreneur in the fintech sector is any worse than it is in, in, in any different sector, necessarily. It might feel that way, but, it, but you know, I'm, not, I'm not sure that I wanna get into comparative victimhood here. Um, and, uh, and what we wanna do is have something that's inclusive for people who are different in general, you know, whether or not that's visible or not. Because I know quite a few sort of white males from say, different parts of the UK and certain backgrounds who are much or are just as, you know, differently um, impacted uh, in terms of their ability to get access to funding than, than other people. And, and it's about inclusion, right? Diversity is about making sure that the best talent gets access, you know, regardless of your, your background. A, a bit idealistic, but there you go. I hope that answers the question. Thanks very much. I'll quickly have a look if any of the panelists want to add something, otherwise, I'll go to the next question. And there's a question from Roy in the US. Are US are entrepreneurs missing a trick by rushing to reopen and operate the way they were pre-COVID? I'd love to go to Chris Devereau for the, this one to begin with. Yeah, so I mean, what I've observed is um, there is a strategic question in most cases that faces um, entrepreneurs, entrepreneurial businesses, startups at this point, whether they should continue to pursue the thing that they were pursuing before COVID came along or whether they need to change in some significant respect as a result of COVID. And in a way, you might think that the answer to that question was climb on the COVID bad market. You know, if, if, if the funding that you were seeking for something else has dried up or the prospect of getting it has dried up, then find a COVID related reason to, to get funding and, and, and change your business accordingly. But actually, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the sessions that I have seen in the Creative Destruction Lab um, recovery process, quite often, it, 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 you know, the consensus of the, the mentors and associates around the room is that 
actually the, the, it's a distraction and that the company concerned shouldn't twist itself out of shape to try and respond to, to COVID per se, but it should pursue or continue to pursue what it was already doing. So I, I don't think you can legislate for what the right answer is, you know, in a general sense, you have to look at it in each particular case, but you, you certainly have to consider this decision if you are an entrepreneur, to what degree or should I uh, pivot or change as a result of COVID? Wonderful. Um, I, I might go to uh, my next question, which is from Javier in Spain. He's got a very simple question, but I think a question that goes right to our topic of creative destruction. Do you think that the share economy, the Airbnbs and Ubers of this world uh, will collapse? I, I, I'd love to go to um, Julia Hawkins and Chris Wade, um, um, either of them, but I mean, maybe I'll start with Julia in your portfolio. Obviously, there would be probably a few platform plays and um, you probably have a good overview of where, the, where these kind of decisions are going from a venture capitalist perspective. Well, I think it, it's very difficult to see uh, how how these um, how these markets will will pan out, and I think I guess there, there are a couple of of industries that have been really badly affected. Obviously, travel, obviously some of the mobility markets, uh, as well as obviously the, the yeah Airbnb, as as well as as well as Uber. I would say like the, the primary the primary thing that we are message that we are giving our founders that are affected in this way is is that they they have to to look at their cost base and have to look at pr conserving capital and extending runway uh, it, as as Chris said earlier, it's the number one thing that you're actually able to control uh, is the amount of cash that you have, and actually some of the businesses, and this is actually to the to the core of, of the topic that's being discussed today, is is how do founders uh, pivot or how do they adapt their business models and can actually have the potential to come out stronger, because you don't know what the market will look like in in a few months time, um, and and I actually think that there will be I you know I'm not actually saying that I think that uh, Airbnb um, is will have to close I don't even think that Uber will have to close but I do think that there there will be businesses that will look potentially radically different and they and they have to look at um, like what are like I guess the different recovery paths of different countries and then adapt um, and so I guess I, I guess that's what we are that we are seeing in, in some of the some of some direct uh, companies in our portfolio are, are are looking at that in exactly that way. Very good. Chris, you're muted. So we'll go to you. Yes. Look, um, it's 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 interesting to to try and think this through. Um, I think, first of all, there really isn't a play. I don't think we've said this so far. There really isn't a playbook that we can go back to and say, here's what happens at this point in the cycle of a COVID-19 uh, medical emergency and subsequent recession. This, this is new. This is different. One thing I observe, and uh, you particularly see it when you've had the privilege of, of, of uh, working with some of the very early companies out of things like EF, entrepreneurs pivot regularly and frequently anyway. Uh, that is the nature of the business. It is why um, venture capitalists um, spend so much time worrying about the team at the early stage because they're asking a fundamental question. Um, we don't know whether this is going to be the business that they're, that they're pitching will be the ultimate business or bear no relation to the um, business that they're pitching. But we're asking the question, is there the intellectual horsepower? Is there the vision? Is there the just sheer tenacity to build a business whatever way it goes? And this, these are the kind of entrepreneurs that are going to do well. The final thing I'd say is there's a, a great guessing game to be had um, because, of course, no one knows the answer to this. Um, and Julia certainly certainly mentioned that is what is going. What are the what are the, the consumer going to be doing, or more importantly, what are they going to be changing 
as a result of being through this extraordinary experience of which, as far as I can tell, um, the human race hasn't really been through, at least in modern times. Um, how are they going to react? Are they going to be jumping on planes, going into restaurants, going into cars? You've no idea who's been in the next. Is that all just, are we going to have, is society going to have a massive set of amnesia um, about the last two or three months and then go back to normal? Who knows? But it'll be very interesting to see how that goes. Rest assured, entrepreneurs will be watching that uh, extremely carefully and trying to second guess it. And the ones that will win will. I do think to, to add, if I may, to that, Thomas, to, to what Chris has just said, I think it's easy to be paralyzed by uncertainty. You know, there, there is a, a ton of uncertainty out there. It affects um, VCs just as much as it and other sources of funding, just as much as it affects entrepreneurs seeking funding. And the temptation in that circumstance is kind of to, to, to kind of paralyze yourself and do nothing. Well, I, that, I wouldn't advocate that. I do think that you should try and think hard about the problem and make positive decisions, even if those decisions are to say, right, we're going to draw in our horns and um, see this one out for a little while. But, but you know, decisive response to uncertainty, I think, separates the, the, the wheat from the chaff. I completely agree. Yeah. No, um, this is great and it's wonderful to see our panelists agreeing. My job is mostly to create discord and disagreements and puzzles. And so I want to throw in one more question into, into the debate here, which I think is interesting because so far the picture that we've, we've given, the message we've given is entrepreneurs are really well positioned. They have a good amount of optimism. They are flexible, they're fast and um, very, very creative. A question that comes from John basically says, what are the panel's views on some of the large organizations are doing to create barriers of entry? Um, so for a lot of um, um, SaaS products offering digital products for free, I mean, let me broaden that and say, well, we shouldn't expect established corporations to just sit back and maybe they're going to become very competitive and protecting their turf. How much of that is a threat to entrepreneurs? Um, what is what does that look like from your vantage point? Um, Chris Way, do you want to go first, maybe? Um, yes, I guess it's my turn to think on my feet um, um, uh, quicker than, than I have been. Um, it's it's interesting. I'm going to be extremely provocative now and hope that no one's a Microsoft shareholder. Um, you only have to be spend some time on Teams to know there has to be something better. Um, and um, um, so, you know, it, it, it just hasn't been the case that um, true innovation of the scale and nature that's going to be required um, comes from um, big corporations. Um, the hope from our world, our simple little world, is that big corporations sort of uh, get into their corporate checkbook and actually start buying more companies um, um, to, to fill their innovation pockets. Um, that's, that's the way I see it. Um, you know, um, uh, <laughs> It just doesn't seem to be plausible that these super tankers um, can can change. And just to loop back to that previous point, particularly don't, when we don't know which direction the super tanker should be pointed, we just don't know how this is going to work out. So it seems highly improbable to me that actually um, the most ambitious uh, entrepreneurs should be worrying about what the um, the corporates are doing. Okay, I'm going to try and um, go the a little bit opposite, which is that um, I agree, actually, that, that we don't know where we're going. But remember, the name of the game could be just survival. So, you know, um, startups pivot all the time. But startups with uh, longer runways have more pivots before they die, right? And so the more money you have, or rather, the lower your burn rate, the more runway you have, the more pivots you have in you and you can survive for longer to fight another day. The thing that the big corporates have is big, stonking, huge runways, right? They just have to outlast um, some of our startups. And, 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 then, and then they're like Microsoft, and everybody uses Teams and gets sort of uh, locked into it. 
they don't have to be better. They just have to last longer. Uh, Chris Darrow? Yeah, so I mean, I, I do think that large corporations can uh, build railways to, to, to um, pick up the Schumpeter point from earlier, but I think it's rare that they do. And if I was um, an entrepreneur myself actually trying to develop a startup, I would be much more worried about other startups than I would be about um, you know, big corporates. Um, of course, big corporates will attempt um, to do the kinds of things the questioner asked, but, but really their ability to do so is, is pretty rare. And, but, but what there are, of course, is thousands of other entrepreneurs going after the same problem set, and they're the people to worry about. How do you beat them? If I may, I'm just going to build on that. I'm going to ask that question to Julia um, specifically, which is this particular question, I think, is very interesting in the medical and the health sciences in, um, in the industry. And so for the moment, for example, Rush just came out with, you know, um, um, some, some, some new hope on the horizon. Um, but maybe, Julia, can you just focus this question in among the many startups that are trying to develop diagnostics and therapeutics specifically related to COVID? Will they outrun the large pharmaceuticals or how does the game look like in that specific industry? Well, I, I think the, the first thing to say is that uh, this is an enormous market when it comes to diagnostics. Uh, and I think there will be many, many large companies that will be created as a result of, of COVID. So uh, both uh, on the antigen and antibody testing, as well as obviously with vaccines, I think that there is both uh, a, a role for large corporates like we've seen that have been able to, to actually move very quickly. But also uh, we're seeing young startups that are as a result actually of, of COVID and now the fact that they are um, trying to respond and, and quickly deliver both diagnostics as well as potential treatments. Um, I think that actually the, the, the playing field is um, actually quite level. Um, and and may, maybe that's because I'm seeing both the very, very early stage startups coming out of EF, for example, um, with great ideas that actually have been able to accelerate uh, what normally takes months and months and months of development uh, to get uh, products to market in extraordinarily quickly. Um, so, so I guess I'm, um, yeah, I, I feel actually very, very optimistic, both from, for early stage startups, as well as, as well as corporates, specifically within the field of, of diagnostics, as well as therapeutics, which was the question. Yeah, and I could. I think I should add that the 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 market in this health tech space is some multiple of the global population times the number of days in many years. I mean, it is absolutely massive. So there there is a lot of scope for lots of businesses. Wonderful. Now we're almost up for time, and I think what we've done is we've had a, a very rich conversation around sort of the the notion of creative destruction, understanding that the crises create both the opportunities that entrepreneurs go after. They have some advantages, though I think not underestimating who they're up against to is um, obviously a, a, an important part of that analysis. Our audience today is um, quite diverse, but um, mainly um, um, students um, who are really spending uh, time reflecting on what this crisis means for them. So maybe we can literally just end with a 30 second piece of advice Think of them as some entrepreneurs, some people who don't want to do be entrepreneurship. They came into the MBA because they've got very different and very respectable and important and career goals. But in 30 seconds, what is your advice? If you were in some sense, you know, at their stage of the career, what should they be focusing on in the coming month? So maybe we'll just have one quick round of um, words of wisdom from each of our um panelist Chris since you are right now on my screen very visible I'll start with you if you meet Chris Deverell the answer is curiosity I think it's the answer to most things so what, what can they do that that develops that habit um, and thereby puts them in a good position for the future wonderful I'll go to Julia Hawkins final words of wisdom 
I guess I would gravitate towards like, what do you think that you can do that has the biggest impact? Um, and I would always try to gravitate towards that as a, as a, as a, as a question to answer in anything that you do. Wonderful. Chris Wade, final well, word. Yes, I hope I'm on off mute. Um, if entrepreneurship, if technology is something that you're interested, go find the nearest company that is doing something very special for our planet and our society and join them and help them grow that to the, its realization. Alice, final word of wisdom. Um, I would echo that. I mean, I got my MBA at the tail end of the dot-com bust. And I would say get experience. Any experience is better than no experience and risk is relative. So as Chris just said, find something, anything, something, anything impactful, then just do it. Don't, don't stay on the sidelines. And I had no idea what the words of wisdom from our panelists were, but having heard them, um, I, I'd just like to remind our students, we, we, we are actively trying to help. Um, in addition to that, so there are opportunities to get engaged in the Creative Destruction Lab in the recovery program. There are also opportunities in our Entrepreneurship Center um, and the LIBA project, which is precisely trying to give students that hands-on experience that our panelists have just um, recommended working with companies in crisis. Now, this is all the time that we have. I really want to thank our panelists for, I think, making it a very lively, interesting, and insightful um, conversation. Obviously, we didn't get to all the questions that were asked in the chat room, but I think there were some really good questions. So I want to thank the audience for, for bringing them. And hopefully, this is the beginning of a larger thinking process that will take you into interesting directions. Real pleasure to have you all there. Thank you very much. I believe that's all.